Good afternoon, everyone. I'm Matthew Goodman, Senior Vice President for Economics at CSIS. We're delighted you can join us virtually today. Uh, this event is part of a series of conversations that the CSIS Economics Program hosts with senior policymakers in the United States and abroad, discussing critical issues at the intersection of economics and national security. Hi, and I'm Erin Murphy. I'm the Deputy Director and Senior Fellow with the Economics Program, and today I'm co-hosting alongside Matt. For this interview, we'll start with a few of our own questions for the Undersecretary, but towards the end of today's show, we'll be taking questions from the audience. To those that are watching online, please submit your questions by hitting the button below this video on the CSIS webpage. This afternoon, we're delighted to be joined for a conversation with the U.S. State Department's Undersecretary for Economic Growth, Energy, and the Environment, Jose Fernandez. Um, Undersecretary Fernandez was confirmed by the Senate on August 6, 2021, and rejoins the State Department after serving as Assistant Secretary of State for Economic, Energy, and Business Affairs in the Obama administration. Prior to that, Secretary Fernandez had a distinguished uh, career in international M&A law at a leading U.S. law firm. In his current role, Undersecretary Fernandez oversees a truly broad uh, portfolio of issues ranging from energy and economics uh, to oceans and food security. Uh, Undersecretary, thanks for joining us today. Thanks for having me, Matt and Aaron. Good to be here. Thanks. Delighted to have you. Um, so you recently made a trip to Korea, Japan, maybe other places in Asia. Uh, interested in what you took away from there and, and then sort of how that fits into what you're looking to do, what you're looking forward to in 2023. Yeah, so I was there um, a week and a half ago, both in um, <clears throat> Korea and in Japan. And, you know, Korea and Japan were among the first two countries that I spoke to when I uh, took this job. One of my earliest calls was to my counterpart in Japan, and immediately afterwards I spoke to my counterpart in Korea. Uh, and since then, we've been able to set up a, a couple of economic dialogues where we really have been able to, I think, move the, the needle in terms of our economic and, and other uh, relations. Uh, in Korea, where I spent about three days, uh, the, the topics were pretty, uh, pretty straightforward. Number one, the CHIPS Act. I met with a number of Samsung executives, and they had been uh, they had announced that they were going to make major investments in in the United States in the chips area as a result of the Chips Act. And then we spoke at length, uh, and I spoke to several uh, companies and also the government officials about the uh, the IRA, the Inflation Reduction Act, which I'm sure will be on your one of the topics that you'll want to talk about. But it has. Uh, it has uh, been something that, that has, has gotten a lot of attention in, in both uh, in Korea and Japan. And we should talk about that because I think that those were very productive uh, conversations that I had in, in both Korea and in Japan. And of course, we have other, uh, other initiatives, other projects that we're working on in both countries. 5G is an area that uh, I think we're, we're spending a lot of time on. Uh, uh, critical minerals uh, is another area that we've been able to, I think, uh, work together to try and, 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 uh, and work on our clean energy uh, initiatives and the like. And in both cases, I have found uh, that the Koreans and the Japanese uh, have, been, have been excellent partners. Excellent. Excellent. Well, we're going to ask you about it, as you, sure uh, you projected. Are. We're yeah. going to ask you about a couple of those things um, in, in this conversation. But, but let me start by asking about China. Um, Secretary Blinken, your boss, um, has outlined a, a China strategy where the U.S. is going to, quote, compete with confidence, cooperate wherever we can, and contest where we must. Um, you know, frankly, the emphasis seems to have been more on the sort of compete and contest part um, with, with a number of significant actions like the October 7th semiconductor export controls uh, that we've been focusing a lot on. Um, but, but now, since uh, President Biden and President Xi Jinping met uh, at ba in Bali in November, there seems to be an effort to also seek areas of, if not cooperation, at least where we can talk about um, things where we have shared interests. Um, and so I, I guess the basic question is, how do you, how do you balance these things? Because, because they are sort of, it's a nice headline with a sort of alliterative <laughs> set of verbs there, but it's actually quite difficult to balance these different elements of competition and, and cooperation, right? You know, uh, China has a different vision of, of what it'd like the international order to be and also of a government's relationship to its people. So we have to start from, from that premise. 
Uh, it also has, as Secretary Blinken has said several times, it also has the technical and the economic wherewithal uh, to, to pursue its interests. What we've said is we will, uh, as you just mentioned, we will compete, uh, we will cooperate, and we will contest. And in all, th in all three areas, I think uh, you, we've seen progress. We've seen in the terms of, of competition, the first thing that uh, <clears throat> President Biden has also been clear on this, uh, in order to compete, we've got to improve our own situation. So the, the IRA, the CHIPS Act, the Inflation Reduction, the, uh, uh, the Infrastructure Act, all those are ways for us to try and improve our own situation so that we can compete uh, with China. We also need to provide a vision uh, for the future. I mean, you were around <clears throat> a man in government in 2008 when China was basically trying to argue that uh, democracies couldn't solve today's problems. Well, we have to show that democracy works. So that, that vision has to be articulated. And then we need to work with our allies and partners. And we also need to work with our private sector. And I always say that that is our competitive advantage. Give us our allies, give us our partners, give us our private sectors and, uh, sector, and I'll take my chances with anybody. Uh, so that's on the, uh, on the compete side. On the cooperate side, it's you know, climate change. We ain't going to solve it. And we ain't going to make a dent unless the Chinese are, uh, uh, work with us uh, on health. All of these are areas where we, we're just too big uh, and, and too important in terms of economies and, and, and nations for us to not be able to work together on common, on common problems. And then on, on the contest side, well, uh, we have some major difference and we, differences, and we've been clear about them. We, uh, We've got to find ways to create a level playing field for our companies and for our workers. And so things like um, environmental standards, things like uh, uh, economic support for state-owned enterprises, things like um, uh, excess capacity that, you know, w w that allows for predatory pricing uh, uh, strategies. Those are things that we need to contest. We need to find ways to create that level playing field, and then, uh, and then you know we will we will take our chances. But that's the strategy, and I think I, I think the broad strategy has not changed. The uh, uh, what what you will see is in different different times you have different emphases. But uh, I, I do think the cooperate, contest, and compete strategy is one that's guiding us all along. Great. I, I want to bring Aaron in in a second for to talk about another topic, but just to follow up on China. Um, I mean, do you expect uh, there to be actual sort of processes of discussion with China? Uh, work there been there's been talk about working groups on climate change, pandemics, um, debt uh, challenges, and are these things that you know we're going to be able to actually make some progress on and recognize that progress as something where we can say, yeah, we're China's making some steps that are actually going to improve um, well, you know, the I, relationship. I think, um, you know, you, you've seen Secretary Kerry engage with China. Uh, uh, often on, on climate change, uh, what, you, what we're trying to do on health, what we're trying to do on food. Uh, we have to, we have to engage. Uh, it's just too, too large of a nation for us to be able to ignore them, nor would we want to. And so uh, that's, that's the hope and that's the aim. Okay, good. Erin? Sure. Um, I'm going to shift us over to clean energy transition. You just talked about climate being uh, an important issue for this administration. It's certainly been emphasized um, in initiatives, this commitment to clean energy solutions, um, both in domestic and foreign efforts. Um, but you mentioned China as being a challenge, but we also have another challenger in Russia and its invasion in Ukraine and how that's impacted global energy supplies, including for our allies in Europe, who are still dependent on fossil fuels, and it really addresses or amplifies that issue of energy security. So how can the U.S. balance its interests in global energy security and still support this transition? So, Aaron, I think the short answer, and I'll, I'll try and explain it, is we've got to thread the needle, okay? Uh, uh, Russia's invasion of, of Ukraine, uh, its attempt to basically uh, um, um, ignore borders that have been um, that have been sacrosanct for since World War II uh, in terms of invading another country's border. Um, it's, it's attempt to weaponize energy is something that has not only had an effect on, on, on Europe, but it's also, uh, it's also uh, affected the food, and, the food security 
in places like Africa. I think the last number that I, um, that I read was upwards of 800 million people around the world are food insecure. Uh, and a lot of that is a result of the, of the disruption caused by the invasion. Um, on the energy side, um, you know, we had been talking to the Europeans for a long time about their dependence on, on Russia's uh, oil and gas. And I think it exposed that vulnerability. Uh, and I think before the war, 50% um, um, of gas imports um, into the EU came from Russia. Um, upwards of a third of oil imports uh, came, came from, uh, from Russia. Uh, those numbers have obviously been reduced uh, significantly since then, but I think what, what we've realized is that um, they could not continue to depend on someone who, that was willing to, to use energy uh, as a weapon. It's also shown uh, and this gets to the other side of the, of the question. It's also shown uh, that the, the, the most straightforward way for us to achieve energy independence is through clean energy. Mm -hmm. and, uh, and I think you've seen uh, in our goals in the U.S., 50% uh, of electric vehicles by, by 2025, I believe, um, emissions-free electricity by 2030, the IRA and others, I think we have shown in the U.S. Uh, that we will put our money where our mouth is. Uh, and I think uh, you're also seeing the markets cooperate. It is right now cheaper to build uh, a solar plant or a wind farm, um, way cheaper than to build a new oil, um, coal or gas plant. And so you have a combination of the market, you have a combination of the war, uh, at the same time, uh, it's always been clear that this is not going to be an overnight effort. Uh, and so uh, we have, we will continue to rely uh, on, on oil and gas and fossil fuels going forward. And we've got to, while, while we keep in mind our long-term goals, uh, we also have to be able to, to uh, keep the lights on. And so I do think it, that's what I meant about threading the needle. We have a long-term goal or even a medium-term goal that we cannot afford to miss given all that we're seeing on climate change. But at the same time, uh, you know, we, we will be in this, in, in this situation for a while. Mm -hmm. So one of those solutions you mentioned was electric vehicles, and of course battery technology, and that relies on critical minerals, which mm -hmm. was a topic of conversation yep. with the Japanese and Koreans. So we'd love to hear more about what your conversations with them are, but also in that context, Minerals rely on lithium, or the critical minerals like lithium, cobalt, they're essential for these types of technologies. But, of course, where do we find them and who has control over it is mostly China. So how is the U.S. dealing with this issue? How do you see this in your portfolio in trying to find alternative sources of rare earth mining, working with partners, um, and anything that you can share from your, your trip with, to Japan and Korea? So um, you're now touching a subject near, near to my heart. Perfect. Mm -hmm. uh, Great. Um, look, we've, we've got a problem. The problem is for us to reach our clean energy future, we're going to need 42 times. That's 42 times the amount of lithium that we use today. Hmm. Start from that premise. Um, critical minerals writ large, you will need anywhere from three to six times the amount of, of critical minerals that we use today if we are going to be able to, uh, <clears throat> to reach our goals. 60%, 70% of, of critical minerals is, comes, is mined um, in, in or by China. 70 to 80% of the processing is done in the PRC. And that's a vulnerability. It's a vulnerability not necessarily because it's China. Mm -hmm. It's a vulnerability because COVID has shown us that we cannot depend on a single source for anything. Right. So what have we done? And I'm very uh, proud of what the State Department has been able to do on this. Uh, we have, early on, we've been, we, we talked to the Japanese, to the Koreans, and to many others, and they were worried about the same thing. Mm -hmm. uh, and so we have put together a, a partnership that we're calling, we have called the Critical Minerals Partnership. Uh, we announced it back in June, and it's 12 countries. There will soon be a 13th, but I can't disclose it yet. Mm -hmm. <laughs> uh, um, where we've gotten together, and we're going to do a number of things. Number one. We are going to share information uh, in a, on a timely basis. We don't want to know 
about a transaction that closed. We want to know about a transaction that's possible. Mm -hmm. So we're going to do, uh, we're going to share information among all of us. We will share uh, financing opportunity. We will uh, engage our private sector, again, our competitive advantage. We are going to uh, start working. It's, 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 it's early days, but we're going to start working on recycling. Mm -hmm. uh, there, is, there are people out there who will tell you that in a few years, 20% of the electric vehicle batteries will be from recycled materials. We've got to start working on that technology. And lastly, and we're, we, we stress this, our calling card will not be a race to the bottom. A lot of mining projects today are environmentally unsound, are not supported by communities, do not bring benefits to the people uh, in, in, in whose communities the mines exist. We are going to stress, and our calling card will be the highest ESG principles mm -hmm. uh, out there. We, if, uh, there is no reason why a Zambia needs to accept low environmental standards, low governance standards, corruption in order to get investment. We will insist that a U.S. company that, uh, that goes to Zambia, to use that example, uh, use follow U.S. standards, mm -hmm. and if we do that, then we believe that we will be able to move the needle, make a dent on that vulnerability that we have today. I think that a lot of people will be happy to hear that because certainly you don't want to have a trade-off with one solution solving another problem, and there's certainly concern around the environmental downside of rare earth mining and critical mineral sure. mining. Um, and battery recycling. Mm -hmm. What do we do with all this electronic waste? Mm -hmm. um, so how do you enforce those standards? Are there efforts that state well, departments we, undertaking? Um, we, we will insist that our partners, that our companies, that the companies that participate in the partnership uh, adhere to those principles. There are principles, there are a number of, of standards that you can follow, all of which are, 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 are among the highest ESG principles. We will insist on that. The other thing is, that as we go around the world, uh, countries everywhere will tell you that's exactly what we want. Not only do we want the investment, um, but we also want the highest environmental standards, and we also would like to not just be a mining, a, uh, a source country, we would like to be involved in the downstream, in the processing, on the value-added side. Uh, so I think we're pushing an open door. But what countries are telling us is we need options. Uh, if, if the only option we have is an investment by a company uh, w with a questionable past and a questionable record on the, on the environment, on, on, on corruption and the like, we, and we don't have a choice, we, we may just have to accept it. Mm -hmm. And so we need to, I think we're pushing an open door, and it's our aim uh, that our, uh, to get our companies and to get our, our partners to do uh, to engage in critical minerals uh, sourcing in the right way. Great, really helpful answer and, and sort of supports some of the things we're also looking at and we, we want to be um, uh, helpful as we can as a think tank on these issues because they're very, very critical mm -hmm. um, on a lot of levels. Um, but if I can just shift the focus a little bit to trade or trade related mm -hmm. issues. Mm -hmm. So the Biden administration has announced um, uh, two uh, new trade related initiatives regionally that, that I think you're very involved with. One is the um, Indo-Pacific Economic Framework, or IPEF, um, and the other is the America's Partnership for Economic Prosperity, if I've got that right, APEP. Um, We're big on names. Yeah, you, know, you got an, an initiative. <laughs> and acronyms, right? yeah. And acronyms, good. Uh -huh. um, so they're sort of parallel initiatives with similar content, not exactly the same, but sort of similar yeah. to deepen economic engagement with these two critical regions, the Indo-Pacific and the Americas. So just simple question, what are your sort of expectations for progress on either or both of these initiatives in the year ahead? So uh, IPEF, the Indo-Pacific Agreement, started for a year. Uh, and uh, APEP, which I've been asked to lead a big chunk of at the State Department, uh, started um, you know, a couple of months ago. So, uh, but it's my hope uh, that both can be completed this year. Okay, and that's, uh, uh, and that's something that's, uh, that, that's our intention. So and maybe even before the APEC uh, meeting that the I, president's I, hosting know, in, I've, in I've, I've, November? I can be a lot more precise I on see. APEC okay. and a, than IPEC. APEC but, uh, okay. Uh, but um, you know, you'll have to talk to my colleagues at uh, Commerce and USTR. But I think the, what I'm hearing is, and I heard this in Korea and in Japan as well as here in DC, 
is that progress has been good on IPAF. Uh, there, it, the, these are ambitious agreements, uh, but all I'm hearing, in, at least from my Indo-Pacific friends, is that progress is being made, and, and, and everyone's, everyone's hopeful. On APEP, well, we're starting a little bit behind, but hopefully we can, we can catch up, and that's, that's my aim. But if I could just ask sort of two related follow-ups. One is, um, you know, I talk to people in the Indo-Pacific region in particular a lot, and, and <coughs> one does hear you know, positive things about IPEF, but also hear maybe an additional hope that the United States will participate in something a little more formal, a traditional trade agreement of some kind, like the Trans-Pacific Partnership or some, not to introduce another acronym here, uh, it doesn't have to have that acronym, but something that is a sort of regional comprehensive trade agreement. Is that something that these initiatives in, in both regions, there have been um, at least elements of, of regional trade agreements the U.S. has participated in the past, is this a future that we're ultimately seeing these things lead towards? Um, well, let's start from the one that I know best is uh, APEP. Uh, you know, we have uh, free trade agreements with um, nearly a dozen countries in Latin America. Uh, it's, 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 it may be more of an issue on the IPEF side, but, but look, um, and this is a conversation that I think would, would be good to have on, on, on a longer basis. I think we are looking to move beyond traditional trade agreements, and we're looking to. And, and if you if you listen to Ambassador Tai, uh, she will tell you that you know worker centric agreements are are, are USTR goals. And, and oftentimes, Matt, in my view, uh, we make the mistake of 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 analyzing trade agreements simply by by reference to uh, market access. Uh, and that may be something that, that requires a conversation. You know, there's a belief that unless you have broad market access, it's weak tea. I would argue that that's not the case. I would argue that um, oftentimes, and I know this from my experience, uh, you know, in, as a business, on the business side and on the private side, oftentimes companies, are, what deters a company from investing in a country isn't necessarily the ability to import. Uh, uh, tariff-free into the U.S. But, you know, if you look at applied tariff rates, average applied tariff rates into the U.S., 3.5%, um, 4% average. So it, it's not that as much as instability, business climate, corruption, regulatory issues that keeps companies from investing. So what are we trying to do in these agreements? I, I would argue that what we're trying to do is to craft a new uh, a new, new rules of the road. Uh, to, to create rules of the road where our workers can compete. Uh, again, not a race to the bottom. Uh, and I think uh, our agreements, I would argue, try to establish a new global code of conduct. A code of conduct where uh, uh, countries uh, work together to um, uh, on supply chains, where they work to deter corruption, where they work to uh, um, uh, bring benefits to their people to create the stability that I think investors need. Because again, in my experience, what keeps a, a company often from going to a country is in the tariff rate. Uh, sometimes it's the double taxation treaty, that's yet another story, but what keeps them from going in is all of these extraneous uh, business climate issues where they just don't feel they can invest. As you say, a topic for a, a longer discussion <laughs> on another occasion, but, yeah. but, but good answer. Um, yeah, thank you. Uh, but let me ask one more follow-up. And before yeah. I do, let me just remind the audience that if you'd like to ask a question, there is a button, I think, on your screen. Uh, feel free to start um, uh, asking questions, and we'll take a couple of those if we have time. Let me just ask, though, I mean, the other thing that you hear from our partners is that, um, in addition to the sort of possibly missing element of our, of our policy, is the things we are doing like the, you mentioned, the Inflation Reduction Act, you know, have elements of, let's just call it protectionism in them, that, you know, we're, we're, we're favoring um, mm -hmm. U.S.-based uh, production and trade. Mm -hmm. And, um, you know, how do you, you, you alluded to it yourself, you probably got an earful of that as I did when I was mm -hmm. in Korea mm -hmm. last fall. Um, you know, how do you answer that, um, that point? Well, this was a topic of, uh, this is when you know you've got friends. When, uh, when you can uh, discuss these things respectfully, 
uh, as you would in a, in a family where your objectives are quite, quite similar, a clean energy, a clean energy future, uh, uh, economic benefits for your, for your, for, for your population. Uh, so we talked a lot, uh, both in Korea and in Japan. We also, in our dialogues in Japan, which was a week ago, about 10 days ago, we talked about this and also with the, with the Koreans. The first thing I said is, we take your concerns seriously and we are going to continue talking about them and, and, and look for ways to try and ameliorate some of, the, some of, of what you believe are the unfair, uh, unfair consequences. But for, let's also take, let's take a step back and let's, let's just make sure we know what the IRA has done. Number one, it's, you know, we, we, we continue to be criticized for not, again, not putting our money where our mouth was. You know, talking uh, clean, clean energy, clean climate, and not putting any money behind it. This is the largest investment made, I believe, in, at any time in the, in the history of the world on clean energy, $370 billion. Start with that premise. That's good. That's a plus. Uh, uh, we then look at what Treasury has done to try and deal with some of the concerns. Uh, it made clear uh, that uh, the, 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 the tax credits, tax benefits in the, in the legislation uh, apply to clean to commercial vehicles, uh, uh, leased vehicles. 20 to 40 percent of the automobiles sold in the U.S. Uh, every year fall under that commercial vehicle exception. So, you know, cut almost a third to a half of that. Uh, we then, uh, in Korea, this, is, this, is, this, this resonated. You know, we're expecting that by 2025, 70% of the, bat of the electric vehicle batteries that come into this country, that are imported into this country, will come from Korea. If I were a Korean company, I'd be happy with that. Uh, and then on the, on, the, uh, on the solar panel producers, you know, the, the day after I left, not because of my visit, uh, Han Wasel announced a $2 billion uh, uh, solar cell uh, plant in, in, in Georgia. 50% uh, today, 50, half of the solar cell cells that, uh, that come into this country come from Korea. So there are benefits. Uh, there are also concerns. The Europeans have concerns as well. And we take those seriously. We're going to try and, and, and see what can be done within the law to, to see if we can allay some of those concerns. But let's, let's, let's also uh, give credit where credit's due. And that is, $370 billion for a clean energy future is something that we will all benefit from. Okay, Aaron, over to you. So now we're gonna move on to development. And mm -hmm. this gets to project finance, to infrastructure. Mm -hmm. um, State Department is the chair of the board on the U.S. International Development Finance Corporation, which is really the U.S.'s development bank. But looking more broadly at where the U.S. would look to invest, and including these big initiatives, whether it's the Partnership for Global Infrastructure and Investment through IPEF, APEP, the whole alphabet soup, mm -hmm. one thing that stands out is that the global south is facing increasing economic stress, and that's due to a variety of things, economic disruption, supply chain, uh, ongoing um, fallout from COVID, um, and debt distress. So with this, how concerned should we be about debt in low and lower middle income countries? Um, big question, Erin. Um, the short answer is we should be very concerned. Mm -hmm. um, just to use a couple of examples in Latin America, 8% of the population, 30% of the fatalities from COVID. Wow. Uh, they are still recovering. Uh, we, you've, you've, seen in, you've seen what's going on in Sri Lanka with their debt. Uh, in Zambia, uh, uh, Secretary Yellen was here yesterday and she spoke uh, about the Zambian debt. Uh, Ghana, there are other countries in, in Africa that are on, you know, may, may default on their, on their mm -hmm. sovereign debt. And n not only does this have a humanitarian, uh, catastrophic humanitarian effect, uh, but it also has, has an effect on the ability of governments to deliver, uh, in the ability of democracies to work. When a President Hishalema takes office in Zambia, he's promising a new uh, f beginning on, on corruption, 
-hmm. on development. The, the debt situation constrains their ability uh, to do that. It cripples, it cripples their agenda. Um, how, how, how am I thinking about this? How I think are others in the U.S. government thinking about it? Well, it begins with transparency when you're talking the debt. You know, um, many of, of the loans that have been signed by some countries with African countries literally include confidentiality clauses that prevent those governments from going to their people and telling them how much they borrowed, mm -hmm. at what rate they borrowed, and when, when the repayment is due. And that's by, in the agreement itself, in fact, there was a, a leak, it was a leak of, of, of loan documents in, from Senegal. The literally, when I read them, I said, well, how do you hire a lawyer when you can't even tell a third person what, now, that has to stop. Uh, one way to start dealing with the debt situation in Africa is to have governments be able to tell their people what, what they have done to disclose what's happened. The other piece uh, is, you know, the Paris Club uh, mm -hmm. and the G20 have come up with a common framework for debt development, uh, uh, for debt treatment, sorry, where basically all creditors have to be treated the same. Mm -hmm. in, in, in the legal business, it's called a pari passu treatment. Uh, uh, that has to be observed, and, and in, in our case, in the U.S., we've also gone a step further. And you know, if you remember the HIPAA initiative uh, from 1996 onwards, 31 African countries have, have taken advantage of it. 75 billion dollars have been uh, billion dollars have been restructured uh, during the pandemic. Uh, we suspended almost, um, well, actually, more than 13 billion dollar in payments from 48 countries that couldn't pay because of COVID. Um, so this is an issue, and I'm, I'm glad you raised it, uh, and the Japanese have expressed uh, great interest in dealing with this issue as part of their G7 presidency mm -hmm. uh, this year. So you will hear more about this. Well, as you highlight, you know, <clears throat> these issues are still ongoing. These countries are still recovering. Um, but the needs for infrastructure, uh, health care infrastructure, energy transition, they're still pretty great, but COVID has just busted their mm -hmm. budgets as well as supply chain yeah. issues and just the recovery. The multilateral development banks and private sector, how do you see their role? How do you entice the private sector to get involved? And how does the U.S. see working with multilateral development banks like the World Bank in, in these low and lower middle income countries? Yet another question that could take. <laughs> I, I only bring the, the yeah, that could take uh, <laughs> that could take a few hours, um, but it's a great question. Um, a couple of things. Um, infrastructure is a tough business. Infrastructure uh, is the kind of investment that you can't just pick up and leave. Once mm -hmm. you make it, uh, you're stuck there. Uh, that uh, makes certain companies in, in general more cautious. Uh, there's more we can do on de-risking. Mm -hmm. Uh, we also have to get our private sector to step up to the plate. Uh, U.S. companies, uh, U.S. companies traditionally have not been as active as others. I remember going to countries in North Africa and, and uh, when Matt and I were at the State Department together, and I would go to a, I'd land at the airport, and there would be Turkish companies, infrastructure companies, Spanish companies, uh, Chinese companies, no U.S. companies. Mm -hmm. uh, we've got to do a better job, and that's what PGII. Uh, intends to do. Great. Great. Well, we've like covered about 40% of your portfolio. <laughs> well, There's a lot more that we could cover, but I do want to get the audience in here, and we have, um, we have a couple of good questions coming in, if you're willing to take, take a couple. So one that's come in is about Ukraine, um, and the question is, how do you talk, uh, or can you talk about how state and you are thinking and planning, I would say, uh, the, the post conflict reconstruction efforts, um, you know, especially on good governance, which has been historically a problem in um, Ukraine. But, you know, obviously there's physical devastation, there's uh, rebuilding um, institutions, there's going to be a lot of money needed. Um, so the, the questioner is asking about, you know, how are we going to get the sort of support and help from donors in the private sector? Um, what are we what are we planning to do? Well, um, that's 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 a question that, as you can imagine, uh, takes up a lot of our attention. Um, we are thinking about it. Um, we start really with, um, at least on a personal basis, great admiration for what's happened, what the, what the Ukrainians have, have tried to do. Uh, you know, Putin um, said earlier, early in the war, that he didn't think Ukraine 
was a country. He knows better. Uh, these are people who will fight. Uh, uh, you know, I, 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 I go to sleep thinking about Ukraine, I wake up thinking about Ukraine, and in between I, I think of how we can help. Uh, we, uh, we cannot let it fail. Uh, and so there are, this will be a kind, I know that uh, the private sector has approached us, there is interest, obviously the, uh, the situation on the ground will, will need to stabilize. Uh, but I think there'll be interest, and I think a lot of that uh, will be to the credit of, of, of the Ukrainians who have shown what a, you know, what a determined, uh, courageous people will do to, to preserve their freedom. Okay, well, more on that. We've just, um, CSIS has recently um, run a commission. Our colleague Dan Rundy's been running a yeah. commission on Ukraine reconstruction. Yeah, you may have seen the issue. In fact, I, I have read, there have been good. a couple of good studies. There's been one published by a number of economists. There's also the one that, that, that CSIS put, put out. Right. We're reading those, and they have, good, uh, uh, they have good ideas, and I think at some point it would be worth uh, having sit down like we've done in the past and right. some issues and... And getting happy, your advice. happy to do that. No, okay. it's been that was really yeah. good work, and I, I'm glad you're, you're uh, looking at it. Uh -huh. Aaron, you want to take another question? I think in a similar vein, um, and talking about reconstruction, but also construction, and, and going off of our conversation around development, um, do you expect more activity under USG infrastructure development initiatives? Yes. Oh, yeah. Of course. I mean, that's what PGII is all about. Um, you know, the the infrastructure. Is, is is probably the the item in the, in the, on the wish list in in the developing world that we hear the most about. Mm -hmm. But it's not just a, you know it's not just a strategic imperative in the sense that that you've got to be able to provide to help countries get it get the right um, port facilities, airports, water, uh, electricity, um, renewables. Uh, it's also a business opportunity. I mean, <laughs> there's money to be made here. And I think part of what we have to do is to help our companies and companies in the, the, that we, in other countries, participate. And that therein lies the challenge. It's an imperative, as we have that imperative as a, as, as a, as a government, but I think also our companies can, can, can profit. And uh, how you do that, well, you know, you've got, there's been some great work done by, by the DFC, by the Development Finance Corporation, there's been uh, good work. Uh, by Exim as well, that you know we have been cooperating in a number of areas, and we'll continue doing that. Great. Uh, I think we have time for one more. Uh, um, actually, just those two institutions, I should say, for our audience' sake, um, State Department is on the board of both the Development Finance Corporation and Exim. If I got that I right, I think uh, the DFC, DFC, not of Exim, not of Exim. Yeah. Okay, but they're important tools of our yeah, yeah. Um, both infrastructure yeah. and other you know policies to yeah. support you know, business and exports and so forth. Um, I'm going to ask uh, one other question about a topic which sort of maybe tangentially came up, which is coercion. Again, slightly uh, shameless self-advertising. We're going to be putting out a big report on March 1st, plus or minus, um, on uh, economic coercion, you know, China's economic coercion, uh, and coming up with sort of a, a both an analysis of, 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 the, of the phenomenon, which is all too common, but also some, we hope, creative suggestions about what the U.S. and allies should do about it. But I'm interested because I know parts of your team have been thinking about this as well. And Ambassador Emmanuel in Japan, it seems to be a top three issue for him. He's spoken to us about this before. Just, you know, how are you thinking about this problem of coercion? And, um, so you, a number of the things that you just mentioned are accurate. Um, we've seen it too often in the past. Australia saw it, uh, the Japanese, the Koreans. Uh, Lithuania was the latest. Uh, we were very much involved in Lithuania. Uh, why? Because we, we had seen it before, but also because we felt that this was a sovereign decision. And it was basically the issue was uh, would a, you know, what, what name would the uh, Lithuanians want to call a, a Taiwanese trade office? Was it Taipei or Taiwan? Um, we thought that was their decision. The, 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 um, the PRC uh, uh, cut uh, uh, the import of first of Lithuanian goods and then of any EU goods that included Lithuanian components. And uh, we were able to get some great support. I mean, we talked just, just a second ago about our Exim Bank. Uh, uh, the, the PRC cut uh, a credit line. There was a $300 million credit line. 
uh, uh, Exxon doubled it. Uh, we, uh, we were able to get U.S. companies interested. The Lithuanians have a laser industry, uh, something I, had, yeah. I learned. In the, well, you know, a number of U.S. companies were interested. So I think we've learned a lot. And uh, this is something that um, we don't particularly relish using, but I do think, uh, and the Japanese are also interested in pursuing this uh, in, as part of their G7, I think there is an interest in, uh, in, in making sure that we can work together as, as you know, the EU uh, filed a WTO case against uh, the PRC as a result. Uh, we can work together and we can, we can basically um, um, preserve a nation's ability to take its own sovereign decisions and call anybody anything it wants without suffering the consequences. Yeah, well, Lithuania is certainly one of the, I think, eight case studies that we're, we're covering in our report, <clears throat> and so we'll, uh, you know, we'll, we'll send that to you when it's, when it's out in, in a few weeks. Um, I think that may be all we have time for. Yep, I think between yeah. our audience questions and our questions, we've now covered 48% of your portfolio. <laughs> so, uh, Mr. Undersecretary, thank you so much for joining us today. And uh, I think we learned a lot here today. And thanks to the audience for your questions. But thank you for coming in to speak with us today. Thank you. Yes, thank you very much. And thanks to the audience for joining us and for your great questions. And, and we hope you'll join us for future CSIS Economics Program events. Thanks so much. Bye-bye.